What's going on, Al? You're having the mistake fixed. What mistake? No, Al, that's not a mistake. This piece works on hierarchy. It's supposed to have that variation as a point of visual emphasis. It annoys you. Well, I suppose that makes sense with you being a robot, but there is a point to it in art. Let's take a walk and I'll teach you about emphasis and how it's used in art. Before we go, though, you may want to have your friend stop painting over the artwork. It's kind of a taboo and might technically be illegal. Okay, Al, so let me explain to you what hierarchy is. Hierarchy is a way in which artists control visual information for us. By using hierarchy, they can manipulate the structure and visual organization of their artwork, and they can lead us to look in the direction they want us to look. Think of it this way. Not everything can stand out all at once, nor can everything be toned down. Thus, we have a visual hierarchy. This happens naturally, but can also be manufactured. Hierarchy has existed forever in the world of art, with certain aspects being emphasized over others. The Egyptians, among other civilizations, used it to show who their leaders and religious figures were, while contemporary artists use it to create visual interest. Regardless, the idea behind hierarchy is based on a singular rule. This is that hierarchy relies on one element standing out against a contrasting element within the visual information. However, this emphasis is relative to the situation in which it exists. A great way to look at this is to think back on a piece like the one you just destroyed. I mean fixed. The artist having made a grid of similar elements varied a singular component of the grid. This became the elemental counterpoint to the norm, and thus, it became the point of emphasis for us. However, if we were to reverse this scenario, then the counterpoint will have changed to be the opposite. You see, the emphasis goes to whichever element is the opposing element, and this changes depending on the situation. This is just a basic rule, though. There are many ways in which this rule applies to art. Well, let me show you, Al. Here we have an example of shifting zones. This shift creates a visual focal point and thus establishes this shift point as the main point of hierarchy. Pictorial thrust will do something similar by pointing our eyes directly where to look. This creates a point of hierarchy for us to focus on. Think of an arrow pointing at something. Breaking repetition is another way to create hierarchies. We have seen this already. This is the change of one element in a sea of similar elements. This works by changing our perceptions of what will occur, thus making it stick out. Positive and negative space can make hierarchies too. If we have an element which is isolated by negative space compared to other elements that are surrounded by positive space, then the odd element gets the emphasis. Here's a very common form of hierarchy with a fancy term. Anthropocentrism is the idea that whatever looks the most human in a composition will take precedence. Thus, figures are always the primary focus in paintings over their surroundings. What do you mean you don't care about us squishy humans? Well, what if I show you this? Exactly. Gigantor is both robotic and humanoid. Thus, we immediately look at him. Not to mention he is huge compared to everything around him. So he becomes the main point of hierarchy. Okay, let's move on. No, Al, we can't just stay here and ponder the glory of a Gigantor. Besides, the hall's just going to move further down the line, making us appear to be moving anyways. Told you so. Anyway, this is another way to create hierarchy in painting. This is the act of breaking balance. Balance, as you know, is created by equal weight to the objects in our designs. However, by breaking this and using asymmetry, we can cause the viewer to look at the point of imbalance. This will create visual interest at that point. Thus, we should always insert our most valuable narrative element in this point of the composition. This next idea works like the use of a rogue element in a series of repetition. According to Gestalt theory, those items which follow the rules of proximity are associated with one another and are therefore grouped together. Thus, by having an element in the composition which breaks this grouping, we isolate it, creating a rebellion against the logical order and developing it as the center of our hierarchy. Okay, Al, so I have a question for you. Do you know what the picture plane is? No, Al, not a picture of a plane, the picture plane. The picture plane is the surface of the canvas. It's that flat plane that artists build the illusion of space upon. Think of it as a window surface. Just like with a window, we can choose to either look at the window itself or through the window to what is beyond. Artists can use this same effect in their paintings provided they understand how this works. A good example are pieces that use heavy impasto paint application. Impasto? Oh, impasto simply means thick paint application that stands away from the canvas's surface. 
Anyway, by using this sort of three-dimensional paint application, the artist flattens the image, forcing our eyes to the surface of the canvas or the picture plane. In essence, we look at the window itself and not into it. Does that make sense? Good. Anyways, if an artist uses impasto paint application with pictorial painting, for example, landscape painting, it creates a shift in the hierarchy. Doing so forces the viewer to switch between looking at the painting surface and at the painting subject intermittently. A similar flattening effect can be accomplished by negating the use of aerial perspective in a work. Taking away this sense of atmosphere flattens the depth of the image and emphasizes the flatness of the picture plane. Using these types of techniques can create strange hierarchies in our pieces, and doing so will also create strange tensions. This can be good or bad, but the key to intensity within a work is this idea of visual tension. Thus, it can be a highly effective tool in our art making. As an artist, you must make decisions about how the formal elements will be arranged and where your focal points and visual paths will reside within your compositions. Placement of these elements can have a great effect on both hierarchy and emphasis. Thus, you want to navigate these choices with the idea in mind that the goal of this is to create tiered levels of tension. Well, there are a few ways to create these tiers. The first is through competing size and value contrasts, like with this work here. This is a work by Michi Meko titled Navigation at Night, Revealing of Self by Chance. In this piece, we have many elements competing in both size and value, but with a clear sense of hierarchy. Here, the round black dot in the sea of white is immediately visible. This is the highest contrast area. It is also a round shape contrasting with the linear marks nearby. These linear thrusts play a large role in establishing hierarchies within this work. You see, there's a vertical thrust in the white that surrounds that black circle. This leads us to the horizontal blue stripes that lead across the center of the canvas. Our eyes go to the left along these lines, and we soon are faced with the second tier of emphasis within the piece. This is the negative shape of a wolf's head. This stands out because there's a contrast between the negative and positive shapes, creating a dark void against the brightly colored linear elements. It is also emphasized by that organic edge breaking the geometry of those lines, further emphasizing the contrast between the dark negative shape and the brightly colored positive elements. From here, the angle of the wolf's snout and the orange diagonal parallel each other and lead our eyes back to the primary point of hierarchy within the image, resetting us on this visual circuit. The third point of hierarchy is the circle above the wolf's head. This too is tied to the circuit by its correlation along that sinister angle and through the arcing blue and gold elements which connect it to the orange line that lies on the Baroque angle, thus keeping our eyes on a regular cycle between the hierarchical tiers. Subtlety is an equally powerful tool in building hierarchy. Sometimes hierarchy is dictated by subtle shifts in value contrast. Other times, it is subtle shifts in scale, among other techniques. This works on very standard principles, such as the fact that high value contrast in a large field of lower value contrast has more visual weight, or that larger shapes, especially when isolated among smaller shapes, have more visual weight. A good example of subtle hierarchies is his work by Eleanor Micas, titled White Paper Fold. Here she has created visual hierarchy through nothing more than paper folding. Notice the subtle vertical folds just right of the piece's center? That is the zone of emphasis for this work. We gravitate towards this area simply because there are vertical contrasts in value caused by the light catching on these folds. This is enough to create a visual hierarchy in the piece. Yeah, I agree, Al. Subtlety isn't my strong suit either. Another way of creating subtle hierarchy ties into other aspects of the topic we have already touched upon. This is the idea that a lone shape in an environment that consists of contrasting shapes will stand out. This, like with contrast of value and scale, can be applied in very subtle ways. Take a look at this work by Jacques-Louis David, titled Portrait of Madame Rocamier. Here, we have a work that largely consists of rectilinear shapes. These are formed by walls and the furniture as well. The result of this is a strong field of geometric shapes. To contrast this and bring attention to the subject, Madame Recamier's arm creates a gentle arc. We complete this mentally thanks to the rule of enclosure, creating a circular shape within this field of rectilinear shapes. This results in a subtle but elevated emphasis upon the figure, particularly the upper torso area. This same technique was used by David in his work Death of Marat. You know how we as artists should also be cognizant of the much larger picture. Take for instance this gallery. We can manipulate such environments to our advantage as artists taking care to use hierarchy to create emphasis of works within our shows. 
How so? Well, take a look at this image from Adele Abdesemed's Unlock exhibition held at the Tang Contemporary Art Facility in Hong Kong. Here we see Adele using the environment to his advantage. Like with the idea of the contrasting shape among a sea of repetitive opposing shapes we discussed before, Adele uses the twisted wreckage of the airplane as a central focal point to the exhibition. The plane is a flat gray color. It is twisted into a curvilinear shape that contrasts the brightly colored square shapes that make up the rest of the exhibition. Echoing this is the contrast between the plane and the rectilinear skylights that adorn the gallery ceiling. Like with a carefully constructed painting, the result of these decisions brings the gallery goer into the exhibition, clearly guiding their attention and making an immediate and direct impact upon them. It sets a hierarchy among the pieces and engages gallery attendees. So you see, Al, there is no end to the possibilities available to you when using hierarchies. They allow you to control visual information and to create better design structure. They also help you with visual organization, which can help the viewer have a clear understanding of where they should look and when. This same principle can also apply to your gallery exhibitions, again, guiding your viewers in the same way we just discussed. With that, I hope you have a better understanding of how hierarchies and emphasis work in art. I also hope you now understand why you shouldn't touch another person's artwork. Are we back where we started? The architecture of this building is really weird. Oh yeah? Well that, whoa, that's a lot of security. I think he made a lasting impression now. Let's go somewhere less conspicuous.